Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as part of the Art and Earth Festival. We're doing a webinar on the Bakey Island Nature Reserve in Campbell River Estuary and the work that Greenways Land Trust has done uh, in terms of environmental restoration there. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, a few notes at the beginning. We are going to have a question and answer session at the end. So there's a chat box within Zoom. You should be able to see uh, a chat box button pop up uh, on your screen somewhere if you move your mouse around a bit. Uh, and please do send us questions through the chat box and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And the presentation will be about half an hour long. Uh, and please note that we are recording this and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, after we're done. We will share it within the next couple of days. Uh, and with that, I will start. Just make sure that I've got the next slide here. Perfect. So my name is Cynthia Ben Dixon. I'm the executive director at Greenways Land Trust, uh, and it's very nice to meet all of you, e meet all of you, uh, did today. Uh, and we also have Camille Andrews. She's one of our biologists working at Greenways, uh, who's also here. So Camille, do you want to? Hi. Go? <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to be spelling each other off uh, to talk about the different various projects uh, with the estuary. Um, Greenways has been doing quite a lot of work in the estuary for about eight years now. Uh, and we were, have been involved with the estuary for quite a long time before that, um, but most uh, intensively in the past couple of years. So before I go any further, I want to do a territory acknowledgement just to acknowledge that, uh, well, I'm in Campbell River today, as is Camille, and we're on the traditional territories of the Wee Kum and the Wee Kai First Nations. Uh, and those are the two nations that uh, have uh, very strong links to the estuary as well. And a little bit of history of the estuary. Um, this picture is of the Bakey Island Nature Reserve. I'll just uh, pop up my mouse here. This here is Bakey Island. Uh, and the Bakey Island Nature Reserve encompasses the island plus a lot of the land uh, in this area here. Uh, and as you can see, this picture was actually taken in 1994 uh, and it, the estuary did suffer quite a lot from industrial use during the 20th century, um, particularly from the forestry industry. Um, so pretty significant impacts to riparian vegetation and estuary vegetation um, from things like um, dry land sort activities, log booming, you can see in the channel here, as well as there's, saw, there's a sawmill here, there's another sawmill over here. Um, so quite industrial uh, throughout, throughout it, uh, the 20th century. And this is a more recent picture. This was taken probably in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, and you can see here uh, the, the areas where the dry land sort were uh, have come back green. Uh, I will tell you that's mostly broom in that picture. So it's mostly invasive species that have come and colonized uh, a lot of the industrial areas. But Bakey Island itself, this was in the middle of the, the very large restoration project uh, where they were importing soils uh, and uh, removing um, invasive species and also impact from industrialization. So um, this is more green uh, in, in uh, more recent years. So it's been nice to see. There's been a ton of support from the community uh, and from other organizations. I think the two main organizations um, that have really been instrumental in getting the estuary to where it is today is the city of Campbell River uh, and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So they had a vision of restoring this area back to nature. And uh, the Nature Conservancy actually did a big fundraising campaign and raised money to purchase this property uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, and then it was sold to the city of Campbell River for a dollar uh, with a conservation covenant on it to ensure that it is being kept for ecological purposes and um, continuing to enhance the nature in the estuary. The Nature Conservancy do also still own a small bit of land at the Ocean Blue site over here, uh, which is a former uh, sawmill site. So they're still landowners within the estuary as well, and the city of Campbell River owned the Bakey Island Nature Reserve. 
and this is just a better map of where the actual location is if you're not aware of it. Um, probably the best uh, way to get there is he here's the main Campbell River and here's the two highway bridges. This is Newbridge over the Campbell River going north towards Sayward. Uh, and if you drive up here, you go through the first set of lights at Woodburn Road, and then you can make a right hand turn pretty much uh, right after the lights. You go through a little bit of an industrial area. It doesn't look like you're going the right direction. Uh, you go down a gravel road and there's a lovely little parking lot at the end and there's access to all the trails from there. Uh, including out Bakey Island itself, there's a nice wheelchair accessible trail. Uh, and then there's the Raven Trail, which goes all the way around uh, to behind the brick. And of course, just a, a few things of what you can do in the estuary. So I would highly recommend if you haven't already um, getting out there um, on the water, you can get to a lot of places in the estuary that you can't by land. Uh, so a little kayak is perfect for, for the estuary. It's very protected waters. There's not too many um, weather conditions that aren't safe to be out there in a, in a little kayak. You do just want to watch out for the float planes though, uh, if you're launching off of Dick Murphy Park on the tiny spit. Um, so there's lots of float planes. Uh, and as well, there's um, lots of opportunities for other types of recreation there. Um, I, I put these slides in, I just wanted to show you the, the changes that have happened a little bit more specifically. So these are aerial photos from the city of Campbell River, uh, their website. You can actually, it's actually really cool. I would highly recommend you can go onto their website and look for their historical aerial photos maps. It's really neat. Um, but this one is from 1965. And you can see in here, uh, I just want to point out this area, which we now call the Mill Pond area, but it never used to be a pond. <laughs> It never used to be open water. There was a river channel going through this marsh area. You can see this area here is marsh. You can see uh, all along here is marsh. This is all forested here, but riparian forest, so not super dense. Um, and uh, that's what it looked like in 1965. You can see it's starting to be developed with this road out into the channel here. But uh, 15 years later, this is what it looked like in the 1980s. So starting to develop this dryland sort area, there's this area dug out. Um, and this, water, this marsh area, um, which used to be marsh, is now totally open water. Uh, and that happened throughout the estuary. A lot of our marshlands were lost um, because they wanted to dig it out to um, provide log storage and log booming um, uh, for the forestry industry. Uh, so a lot of that marshland was dug out and taken elsewhere uh, and a lot of impacts. You can also see uh, it's been pretty nuked in here as well. All very, um, there's a road down here and lots of access in there. Uh, and just further industrialization, this is actually a pretty, pretty terrible photo for what, from what it looked like in 1994. So just stuffed full of logs, um, not much fish habitat or wildlife habitat in here at all. It's been pretty much uh, destroyed at this point. Log booming grounds are not good fish habitat. They shade out uh, a lot of any vegetation that might be growing underneath them, which provides not very much habitat for fish. So um, pretty amazing that we had fish coming back to the estuary at all at this point. But this is 2016. You can see we still have this remnant open water area. We have, there is a little bit of a new marsh bench that was put in here as part of a restoration in uh, the mid 1990s. Um, there's more marsh that was put in up here, but nothing like what, we, what was there before. Um, but it is a lot greener uh, and you can start to see this is mostly alder up in here. It's starting to regenerate naturally itself. Uh, and there's still a little bit of remnant spruce trees that are sitting here as well. Um, but still very heavily impacted this area of the estuary and we are really excited to actually have some more um, restoration plans um, for this area, which I'll talk about later. Um, and Greenways itself, um, we're very much a part of the community and we, we really value community involvement and volunteering uh, and giving people opportunities to get out there uh, and care for the uh, environment themselves and to empower our community to do that. Um, so as part of that, we have a lot of events that we, we do in the estuary. So you can see in the top, that's our annual broom bash. Um, and at the bottom, this is our Greenways conservation team. Um, that's me on a very rainy day. 
<laughs> moving mulch to do to our new plantings. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to get involved. We also do TD tree days. We're going to be doing that again this year in a slightly different format for COVID precautions. Um, we have a ton of school programs that come out and use the estuary. Um, and our, our regular conservation team uh, goes out every two weeks to, to do something within Campbell River uh, that we need we need doing. Uh, lots of tree planting probably coming up, so do connect with us if you're interested in volunteer opportunities. We also normally do run an, an interpretive walk series and workshops, and we work with our partners on events as well. So we've done a, a several um, joint events with the Nature Conservancy um, in the estuary. So I'm going to hand this part over to Camille just to talk to some of the work we've been doing on invasive species. Hi. <clears throat> oh, my voice is gone. Um, this is one of our summer students, Katie, and she's very happy to have just cleared an area of yellow flag iris. And she's one of the only people that would be smiling at this point because it's extremely hard work. Um, with yellow flag, we've got a three pronged approach where we dig um the rhizomes out in areas that are more isolated or lower concentration and we also remove flowers um in areas that we're not able to reach oh, go oh back. sorry that's okay um so we remove flowers in areas where we're not able to do digging or anything else and then the third prong is the next slide which is benthic barriers um, and these are essentially tarps that we lay out over very dense concentrations and they're tucked in around all the edges um, and what that does is create an anoxic dark environment where the rhizomes and seeds are killed off and after one or two years um, we should be able to lift those up and plant directly into soil that has no viable yellow flag iris so this is um, my family helping me calculate the area that we put down this year. And in total, we had 235 meters squared covered this year with benthic barriers, which is great. Um, we haven't got our numbers this year for what we've dug out, but last year they dug out 400 kilograms. Um, we're still digging this year and we still have some piles that haven't been taken to the dump, so we don't have those numbers quite yet. Um, and yeah, the idea is to remove these plants because they're so good at outcompeting the native sedges, rushes, ferns, um, as well as our native um, Henderson's checker mallow, which is a blue listed plant, and some other flowering plants as well. Fantastic. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then purple loosestrife is our next invasive that I wanted to chat about and it grows in similar areas to the yellow flag iris. Um, fortunately for us, not as um, dense of infestations as the yellow flag, um, although it could get there if it was left to do its own thing. Um, so we have a multi-pronged approach for this one as well, where we pull the young ones that are easy to pull, um, dig out older ones that have got more of a root system, and then anything we're not able to get to in those ways, we remove the flower heads so that we're moving the seeds in the habitat. Um, and it also outcompetes native vegetation in the same way that the yellow flag iris does. Um, and we've had several events, this two events this year with the conservation team to remove this from the estuary, which were a lot of fun. Okay, and I'll talk about Canada geese. So um, Canada geese are, they are a native species in Canada, of course, um, but the population we have in the Campbell River estuary during the summer months particularly is not native. We actually don't have a native breeding population uh, on Vancouver Island. Um, so if you see geese here in the summertime, they're, they're not supposed to be here. They're supposed to be, the wild, the wild versions are up in the Arctic um, breeding there. So we have um, quite a few geese that come to the Campbell River estuary to molt, uh, which means that they lose their flight feathers and they can't fly during that time, but it's a nice open area. So, and lots of food for them. So they feel quite safe. Excuse me. <coughs> and there's a lot of impacts that you can see. Sorry, I'm just gonna mute myself one sec here. I can explain what this photo is, if that helps, Cynthia. It's um, 
sort of an experiment that Greenways did where they fenced off some of the sedges um, so that the geese couldn't get into that enclosure just to compare the difference of um, the geese foraging versus areas where they're kept out of. Fantastic. I think I've got the tickle in my throat covered. <laughs> um, and you can really see the difference between inside and outside here. And uh, <clears throat> this picture was taken in 2015. This was a year after we put the fence in. If you go down there now, um, there's a huge amount more sedges in here. It really has grown back really fantastically, but outside still looks the same. So lots of issues with um, overgrazing of sedges and sedges are really important to the ecosystem. Uh, there's a really important um, part of the food web within the estuary because particularly when they die back in the fall, they provide a lot of biomass which provides a lot of nutrients for the invertebrates that are in the estuary. And those invertebrates come and eat kind of the dead sedges uh, but those invertebrates are food for other things, particularly for juvenile salmon. Um, so if the geese eat this all up before they can, uh, they can die off in the fall, uh, then that, those nutrients aren't there. That food source just isn't there for those invertebrates. So uh, we really do um, lack a food source for juvenile salmon. So uh, one of the projects uh, that works uh, on doing some kind of long-term solutions to this is with the Weewee Come Coastal Guardians project. This is led by the Weewee Come First Nation uh, and they have been doing this eco-cultural restoration where they've been putting in fencing to keep the geese out of certain areas of the marsh. So similar to our exclosures but a little bit more natural looking um, and a lot larger areas as well. Uh, and this works because um, geese like to have clear sight lines. They're, they're really um, uh, attuned to predators and so the more sight lines they have the better they are um, and these fences interrupt that uh, as well obviously in the summertime when they're molting and I mentioned before they can't fly uh, so they can't really fly in and out of these areas they have to walk in and this is where uh, the fencing really comes in handy. So that's an ongoing project with the Wee Wee Cum and Purple Martins. Um, Purple Martins are a really interesting project that we've just been getting more and more involved with. Um, the Purple Martin populations in BC as well as yeah, the coast in general declined significantly and um, in 1985 we were left in BC with only five breeding pairs um, and that by 2011 has gotten back up to 750 breeding pairs and that's almost entirely due to nesting foxes that have been put on towers across the coastline mostly by work of volunteers. Um, I'd like to mention the picture below is Ed Silkins who's been volunteering on this project in Campbell River from before there were any Martins here in 1998 and now this year we had 15 successful nests, so that's 30 breeding pairs, with over 50 fledglings, so quite successful. We've got three towers currently. Two of them are on very aging um, old pilings in the estuary, and this one that you can see in the picture is a newer one, um, and it's on a fancy crank system, so you can turn that crank and the nests go up, and then turn it the other way and bring them down for monitoring. So what we do is we monitor the nest boxes. Um, what Ed is doing in this picture is removing a large wasp nest that was interfering with the nesting birds in the other boxes. Um, and so we do things like that as well as monitor the age and success of the nestlings to see how many are fledging. Um, there has also been a lot of banding done, but we didn't do any of that this year. Um, and then the next steps are going to be to remove those old pilings before the next breeding season and put nest boxes on two new piling or two new crank systems similar to the one that you can see here. Um, yeah, I think that's it for that. Yeah, that's a really exciting project. It's really nice that Greenways has been able to, to support Ed and kind of take on the project. He's trying to retire lots of our some of our volunteers, you know, they do eventually want to retire. Um, so it's really nice and it's just nice to be part of such a successful project coastwide. There's a very large Purple Martin nesting box project um, all over the coast and 
pretty much any harbor you go to, you will see some nesting boxes. Um, and it's been really a key to the success of that population. Oh, habitat features, that's for Camille as well. Um, yeah, next I wanted to talk about habitat features. This is an upturned stump that was placed as a habitat feature on the berm trail on Beaky Island. Um, and it has been incredibly successful, this one little one. Every time I've gone by it this summer, I've seen upwards of 20, 30 snakes using it, um, little clusters of about five snakes in the same spot every single time. And I've even noticed they're the same color snake in each spot at every time. So it's been really interesting for me to watch it. And there's always quite a few snakes around the base of it as well. So that's definitely a big successful one. We've also got um, lots of coarse woody debris, which is basically old logs and stumps that have been placed on the ground um, to provide habitat for small amphibians and small mammals. Um, in addition, there have been nest boxes placed in the trees uh, for chickadees and other cavity nesting birds. And bee boxes and insect hotels are another fun one which help increase the diversity of bugs as well as pollinators that are able to live in the habitat. And lastly, we've got bat boxes that have been put up, um, which I think next summer we'll try to monitor a little bit uh, and see if they're being used by collecting poop that falls. So that's that another exciting fun. one. <laughs> this <laughs> so is actually really important in biology. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, deltoid balsam root. So this um, is a really cool species. Um, another one of our kind of very rare species. This is actually critically endangered. Um, and the patch that we have in Campbell River is out on the Tai Spit. It's right before or just right after the turn off towards the Discovery Harbour boat ramp. Um, so if you know where the Seabreeze Cafe is and the Discovery Harbour boat ramp, it's just, uh, just on that turning there. There's a little fenced area. If you go down there in May, you will see lo lovely flowers like this down there. There's about 275 plants in there right now. Um, and that is about 20% of all of the plants in Canada in the whole country um, is in this one little spot on the Thai spit. It's a really cool. Um, there's only about 10 endemic populations within the country, so that's, or left within the country, so that's locations where it still exists. Um, and we're, we're really lucky to have this species within, within Campbell River um, and really cool species to work with. We've been doing quite a lot of work around mapping and surveying, um, monitoring the species. We've been um, collecting seeds and transplanting out seedlings further down the tiny spit. Um, if you actually go to this site, uh, you will see there's an interpretation board there with a picture uh, of, from 1927, from the, look, uh, the picture taken from the tip of the spit looking back towards Campbell River. And the whole Thai spit is covered in deltoid balsam root. It's estimated there was about 50,000 plants there um, before European contact. Um, we're now down to about 300, but we are working. Uh, I would love to see the whole Thai spit covered in these flowers again, um, as it was historically. Um, that would be super fantastic. So we're working on that slowly. Uh, and planting, Camille, did you want to take this one? Sure. Um... Just wanted to mention what an important part planting has been for Bakey Island and the surrounding estuary. In some areas, as Cynthia mentioned, there was absolutely no vegetation and highly impacted. Other areas have been regenerating naturally, but definitely needed some help of planting to increase biodiversity. Um, so, and this is a big project where volunteers have been really key for us for getting this work done. And We've been lucky enough to receive TD Tree Day funding for at least five years, um, and we will have that again this year to do some planting. So really important for being able to increase diversity and follow the succession and change our planting plan every year as the forest matures and allows us to add different things. Fantastic. Okay, so upcoming, um, just to mention, as Camille said, we are going to be doing quite a lot of planting this fall. Um, so we're looking for volunteers for that if you're interested. Um, and of course, we have COVID protocols in place where we've been very serious about COVID protocols and we um, have pretty significant um, precautions in place. So please do contact us um, if you're interested. 
we also have uh, a lot of invasive species work still ongoing. Uh, it is a continual um, project, that one, and we've got a lot of years ahead of us still on invasive species, but I, I have confidence that we'll get there one day um, where we just keep it down to a very, very minimal task uh, rather than the somewhat monumental task that it is these days. Uh, and as well, we've just got notification from one of our funders that we've been approved for some funding for um, continued uh, ecological restoration works and uh, developing a pretty significant restoration plan for the Bakey Island Nature Reserve. So we're hoping uh, that will lead to even more uh, riparian forest restoration, uh, potentially more marsh creation. Um, yeah and lots of other um, habitats within the estuary because there's still lots of um, work to be done on the Bakey Island, Bakey Island Nature Reserve lands. Um, pretty, not particularly on Bakey Island, that is looking really good right now. There is, of course, always work to do there and more planting uh, as the forest matures there uh, to increase additional species, as Camille was mentioning, but uh, lots of uh, other things that we could do in the areas that are predominantly invasive species right now further along the Raven Trail. So that's uh, what we've got upcoming. And just a thank you to our supporters and partners. Uh, here's a big list of them. There's, we're certainly not the only ones working in the estuary and there's a lot of um, people who are very interested to see estuary restoration continue. Um, and we thank them all and all the hard work that they've done. Um, it's been really rewarding seeing the WeWay Come Coastal Guardians program uh, starting up uh, and being able to work with them uh, within the estuary as well. It's been very, very exciting. Okay, so now we come to the question and answer session. Um, so if anyone has any questions, if you could type them into the chat box, to either Camille or myself, that would be fantastic. Um, do you um, have the any first, questions? The first question um, is from Virginia, and she's asking if we've had any studies done about forage fish on Beaky Island or the surrounding estuary. Well, um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada is one of the um, partners in the estuary. They've been down there for a long time doing a lot of work. Um, Shannon Anderson is our local habitat biologist for DFO. Um, and she's been doing beach seining in the estuary for many, many years. Um, I think she's up to almost 20 years now. Um, it's been fantastic to have her and um, have that local knowledge um, being collected. Um, so the beach thing does show uh, juvenile fish populations and they also forage fish as well. Um, I, I don't have that information in front of me, but we could find it for you if you're interested. Just pop us an email. I can connect you with Shannon. Um, and there's no other questions at the moment, but we would give a minute just if anyone has another one, you can furiously type it in and nope. Okay. I think that's it. That is it. Oh, there's another one. Oh, yeah. I think we'll, we'll, we'll give it a few minutes between questions because I, I okay. feel like I'm sure I would be slow typing too. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is not a question, but a, a thank you from Serge. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you, Happy Serge. Happy watching. Um, and another thank you. Oh, and yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank well, you for coming and for watching us. It was really nice to share our thoughts on Beaky. Which yeah, this is a place in Campbell River. This is my first time doing kind of a, a an event like this. Normally, we would do a uh, a talk in person, and we would probably be out on site. Um, but just with COVID this year and the festival, it's a uh, it's a little harder to do that this year. So thank you everyone for tuning in, um, and joining us today, um, from uh, in front of a screen rather than outside. <laughs> I'm sure where we'd all rather be, but uh, we do what we can these days. So thank you very much. It's been very very awesome to have you here and to be able to give this information to you. Yes, thank you. Okay, goodbye.